six weeks in, my brain just changed. And I realized that I would have periods of feeling low for no obvious reason. It would often be my day off that that went and hasn't come back. And I'd be moving between practice, going to, to run a course, and I'd worry about you know, the third patient from the end in the last clinic and whether I'd messed that up. And I'd, I'd wake up at three in the morning and worry about that. And that stopped. It's almost like a superpower. It just gives you a bit more time. So my busy life, which I was enjoying, but I felt frazzled on the edges of, suddenly became fine. Every bit was fine. I'm passionate about evidence-based medicine. I think we should do things where we know they work and we have good evidence. Mindfulness has a secure evidence base on reducing stress. End of. Are you sick of hearing about mindfulness? Does the answer to all of your questions about how can I feel calmer and reduce my stress seem to come back as do some mindfulness? And do you feel frustrated as it feels like there's not enough time in the day to go to the loo let alone spend 20 minutes on meditating. And are you a little cynical and unclear about why and how it will help in the first place? In this episode, Dr. Steve Pratt, GP, appraiser and mentor, joins me to debunk some of the myths about mindfulness and answer the question, is it really worth the time and effort? And will it help me? We talk about why so many of us have tried it and haven't found it particularly life-changing and how to actually make it work for you. Steve did a mindfulness-based stress reduction course a few years ago and after six weeks, something changed. He felt so much better in every area of his life and now he's becoming an accredited mindfulness trainer. To be honest, I really struggled with this episode, not because Steve isn't a fantastic guest, he completely is. But I struggle with mindfulness. It's one of those things I feel a bit guilty about, if I'm honest, a bit like flossing your teeth. You know you should do it, but somehow you can't get into the habit. Even when I know I feel much better, even after just doing a five minute meditation app. And as Steve says, the evidence for its benefit in terms of beating stress and anxiety is so overwhelming that it's mentioned in countless nice guidelines. I'm also worried about putting off listeners who might not want to hear even more about mindfulness, probably for the same reasons as me. But as we discuss, life transformation is about more than quick fixes. It has to be. Reflecting on this, I think the reason I feel so ambivalent about mindfulness is that I know it will take some time investment and some effort to put aside the time to really develop this skill. And it is a skill. And just like any other, it takes practice. So when we write off mindfulness after doing a couple of five minute meditations, it's a bit like spending just five minutes in a swimming pool and saying that we'll never learn to swim and that it had no benefit at all. So please listen to this episode with an open mind and then seriously think about exploring some more of the resources we mention in the episode. I know I'm going to. And at the end of the episode, Steve takes us through a three minute breathing space meditation so you can try it yourself. So listen to this episode to learn why after six weeks, your brain will just change in very unexpected ways. How mindfulness can make you happier and less anxious and what you need to do to get there. Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for doctors and busy professionals in healthcare and other high stress jobs who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr. Rachel Morris, a former GP, now working as a coach, speaker and specialist in resilience at work. Like frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water, many of us have found that exhaustion and stress are slowly becoming the norm. But you are not a frog. You don't have to choose between burning out or getting out. In this podcast, I'll be talking to friends, colleagues and experts who have an interesting take on this and inviting you to make a deliberate choice about how you will live and work. This is going to be the last episode before Easter and I'm going to take a dose of my own medicine and have a complete break for a couple of weeks. 
I'm so grateful to all of you for listening, for recommending the podcast to your friends and colleagues, and for all your wonderful emails, comments, and feedback. Just a reminder that we do produce a workbook for each episode, which you can use to reflect on what you've heard and submit as evidence of CPD for your appraisal. This episode really got me thinking about how we can help our community of listeners. So if you're interested in a You Are Not a Frog online mindfulness-based stress reduction course, then drop me a line. And if there's enough of you, we'll make it happen. And those of you who are interested in a retreat, then watch this space. We're trying to sort it out as we speak. Over the next few weeks, why don't you catch up on some of our earlier episodes and we'll be back in two weeks time with some brand new episodes and content that will help you beat burnout and work happier. It's fantastic to have with me today on the podcast, Dr. Steve Pratt. Steve has been a GP for 35 years. Wow. Both as a managing partner and now he's working as a mentor for GPs on the fellowship scheme. You've also uh, spent 25 years teaching evidence-based medicine to the VTS in Berkshire and the military. And Steve is uh, very well known throughout the country, I think, for being one of the Redwell GP update presenters, which you did for several years, and, and you've only just stopped doing that. So I was leading the Lead Managed Thrive course, and that's where Steve and I met. Steve, I'm going to spring a question on you here, because obviously this podcast is all about beating stress and burnout, but what was the most stressful thing that ever happened to you as a Redwell presenter? There's, a, there's actually quite a long list. I'm not going to miss being in a hall in Edinburgh, 350 people sat down, the murmur's still going on, and we're still waiting for the cable to attach the audio so they can hear what I'm saying. 30 seconds to going live is the closest we've ever got. <sighs> I'm not going to miss that. <laughs> oh, 30 seconds. It's so funny, isn't it? Because when you're presenting courses and stuff, you really worry about what you're going to say and what if you forget this or what, you know, what if you get it wrong? But that's never what happens, is it? It's always something like the tech or there's no coffee or the projector's not working or the trains are like, or something like that. It's never the stuff that you worry about is going to happen happens. It's always the stuff you haven't yeah. thought of. And in fact, once I developed my mindfulness practice, I would do the initial setup. You would hit the inevitable glitch and I would disappear to the lose to do a three-part breathing space that we're going to talk about as we go through this chat. And actually, eight or nine times out of ten, just absenting yourself and reappearing, someone would have sorted it out. And it just stopped me having to engage in the, the stress and anxiety. And if I it hadn't been sorted, I was in a more resourced place to deal with it when I got back. I find that's a very good technique for dealing with children and teenagers, actually. Just leave the room for several minutes or several hours. By the time you get back, they've generally sorted stuff out. <laughs> and did your did your presenting colleagues think, oh, gosh, it's a bad day, isn't it? Because Steve's done three lots of three minute mindfulness breathing spaces already today. We have got Steve onto the podcast to talk about mindfulness. And I thought Steve would be a really fantastic person to talk about this because you Steve you've just got so much experience across the board you know exactly what it's like to work in a really busy busy environment with things coming at you and if I'm honest I really like mindfulness and I really wish I was better at it in fact one of my goals this year is to do some sort of mindfulness course like mindfulness-based stress reduction or something like that mm -hmm. but it can be a bit tricky particularly working and doing the training that I do with people around resilience productivity and stuff that when you ask, what must I do to be less stressed, to be less burnt out? The answer always seems to be mindfulness, mindfulness, mm. mindfulness. And for, for people that aren't used to doing mindfulness or don't know how to do it, or maybe have done it and tried it and didn't really get on with it or don't quite know how to do it, that can get a bit irritating. Yes. <laughs> now, I know that you come to it fairly, fairly late on in your career and, and you said suddenly for you something clicked. So just tell me a little bit about how you got into it and, and what, what happened for you? Yeah, and I, I agree with that leading that resilience, we would all agree, is not just putting a really hard tin hat on and just going into whatever you're experiencing and, you know, you've got this extra layer. 
and mindfulness is often part of resilience courses. And, and I think some people link this, you're not changing anything in my environment, which is generating a lot of how I'm feeling. You just want me to feel better about the awfulness. Actually, that, so I hope this conversation is a real antidote to that because when you have a mindfulness practice and you've moved to sort of the deeper layers of what mindfulness offers, it actually allows you to access much more readily a resourceful space. And we so commonly, in when particularly when under pressure, we will react and we will tend to do what we've always done. And because we do that, we get what we generally get. And so if you can get into a more resourceful space, you can try things in a different way, have different conversations plan things in a different way so i think mindfulness does open up a, a lot of possibilities it's not simply putting a thicker thin hat on and i i knew very little about mindfulness i must admit we had a brilliant associate dean called julie chin down here in hampshire and she was putting on resilience courses and she we invited a local uh, mindfulness trainer to come and do a half day session and out of that grew funded classic eight week MBSR mindfulness based stress reduction courses for GPs. And I got an email and I thought, yeah, I've got some CPD to do. That sounds interesting. I'll sign up. I didn't go, I'm in a terrible, terrible place and I'm, I, I need a resource. I, I was okay. Um, I was always balancing a portfolio, but I thought it was okay. I just thought I was ticking the box and I went on this session it's two hours weekly for eight weeks that's the classic session and of course I went on and like many you have a day silent retreat as part of that and we all sat around 12 GPs eight women four men and Ali said why are you here and we literally said well it was a possibility I wanted to do some CPD I want to help my patients. I need to understand this new technique. And four or five weeks in, when we got to know each other well, we all shared. We struggled in a, a large number of areas. Some people were just barely clinging on. And I went through the program, and each individual session was interesting. You had the support of your colleagues, but I wasn't noticing anything huge. But then at week six, and this is it's, you know, a lot of the research in, in any psychological technique, any habit-breaking technique, CBT, any of these things that are designed to help your brain rewire. If it works for you, it usually works about 40 days in, six weeks in, my brain just changed. And I realized that I would have periods of feeling low for no obvious reason it would often be my day off the one day I was looking forward to do the things I would just feel inexplicably low that vanished that that went and hasn't come back and I'd be moving between practice going to to run a course or going to meet a colleague in an appraisal and I'd worry about you know the third patient from the end in the last clinic and whether I'd messed that up and I'd, I'd wake up at three in the morning and worry about that and I would Think about the appraisal when I was preparing the teaching and that stopped. And I just was able to be, you're in the room to a patient. I'm doing the best for you. We finished the conversation. Cheerio. That's gone. You know, I've, I've done what I can. And I sometimes used to be duty doctor, would finish the day, jump in a car, drive a couple of hours to a district general hospital to work with specialist trainees in general practice. And I could... I could love being with those 40 odd people in Milton Keynes, get back in the car, forget what had been quite a good day, not worry about the tricky question I, I maybe stumbled over, and then think about the appraisal I had the following. So I saw it had immense practical value for me. I, I listened to your last uh, podcast with Graham, and he teaches mindfulness, uh, as do I. And he said, you know, a lot of people don't develop a mindfulness practice. And that's that's probably true for my group. But if you can develop a mindfulness practice, and one of the 
things to do there is to fit it into things that you're doing anyway. So I do a mindful movement every time I exercise. And you can find ways of including a mindful practice in your life. And I do that because I got these big benefits and I didn't want to lose them. And now there are certain skills that you acquire as you deepen your mind that give you practices that, that do specific things. So if you are struggling with relationships, if you're struggling with pain, if you're struggling in other areas, you can use these techniques. You can't use them unless you've developed the skill of, of attention. A lot of people feel that because that's often what they've been exposed to is a taster, that mindfulness is a process where you notice something, you come into your breath, you notice a flower. And if you do more of that, you've got mindfulness. Actually, that's just the, the warm up bit, the muscle of attention. We go to the gym to get fit for our bodies and we build up the muscles. Mindfulness is building up the muscle of attention because we're going to the gym for our mind because we want our mind to be strong. And once you can direct your mind, once you realize that your mind is full of chatter, and when you focus on something, that chatter is very loud. But once you can recognize that chatter is there and bring your focus of attention, once you have that skill, you can use that in, in quite sophisticated and very helpful ways. And that's where the resourcefulness comes. That's where the dealing with difficult conversations and difficult relationships comes as you, as you deepen it by going through the, the full course. There's so much in that I want to ask you about. But can I just ask you firstly about this attention? Because I think there is a bit of a, probably a misconception from what you've said that mindfulness is about completely emptying your mind and not having the thoughts because you pin them to a cloud and you send them off on a car or whatever you do with the thoughts and you're just supposed yes. to sit there with a completely empty mind. But that's not true. No. And that's, that's almost uh, Mindfulness 101, first session, awareness is the sky and thoughts and feelings and emotion of a clown. And actually, when you choose to focus your attention, whether it be on your body, on your breath, sound, later on as you get more skilled on a, on a thought, you, our minds just constantly chatter. But a lot of people are just not aware of that. So what you do is you become aware of the chatter. Oh, I've got that tricky meeting tomorrow. Here I am. I'm supposed to be doing a breathing practice. I'm focusing on the breath. I've got that tricky meeting tomorrow. What you can do is just go, that's a tricky meeting. I am going to a cloud that you push to the side and you come back. But you may go back to it. And that's, as we say on the training, that's um, not a mistake. You've not done anything wrong. And in fact, it's the noticing that's the work. And all you have to do is bring your attention back. Nothing bad has happened. You haven't done anything wrong. And I've had people who've gone away on retreats to try and, and meditate. And the scramble brain and all the, the worries and concerns just gnaw away at them as they get quiet. And that's the muscle. It's, it's noticing that this is happening, but choosing to redirect. And that's what changes the shape of your brain on an MRI. That's what changes the way your brain works on a functional MRI. You know, we have great neuroscience to back up what we're doing. So, yes, it, it is not learning the skill of clearing your mind. It is choosing to focus your attention. And when your mind is distracted from that, logging it and coming. That's, that's the skill you practice roughly for the first half of the MBSR. And what are you choosing to focus your attention on if you're being distracted, being distracted from what? So what you choose to focus in your attention on is, is up to you. And my wife, Jeanette, and I have taught for mindfulness courses for MBSR courses in a sort of faith-based context. So fairly on, early on, you'll do a mindfulness practice called a body scan. You'll often do that lying down. You and do it in other positions. Often people are so exhausted and busy at work, they go to sleep when they try to do a body scan. But you are focusing on sensations that are arising from your body. 
So what you're practicing there is noticing what's going on for you physically. And there's this really interesting sort of set of work that in the West, our minds and bodies have become dissociated. It's not only, you know, our Greek logical heritage about what we value, but our heads are kind of physically set. And as many as 80% of folk in the West cannot access what's going on in their bodies. Whereas in the East, it, there's much more connection between brain and, and body. One of the skills you practice later on is, is think about or get into mildly difficult situations and then become aware of what's going on in your body. But you've got to, because our minds are so dissociated, we're so in our head, you've got to train your self to recognize what's going on in your body and then instead of waiting till your shoulders are up around your ears you've got a pain over your left scapula you feel gastritic and you just feel lousy you know there was a sensation about two hours ago that would have told you this is not great and then you can go okay what do i need to do take a breath think about things that i might change as opposed to just just going on so the point in terms of the, the whole course is to give you a skill at being able to monitor what's being going on in your body give you an early warning when you're using this in day-to-day -day life but it's also practicing the skill of attention there were several things that struck me after i finished my training you know, personally and professionally perhaps if i give you an example of both that uh, i'm a keen walker and I was in the Welsh mountains with my daughter. We were doing a long day, 20 mile plus day with a group. So it's early in the year. Um, uh, there's a stand of silver birches. And I, I just always feel compelled to talk to people. So I would have gone over naturally either to check that my daughter Laura was OK or, or someone I've been speaking to on the walk. And I felt really comfortable just detaching myself from the group. And I looked at this stand of silver birches and I can see them now. And I just focused all of my attention on early spring and the, the birch trees blowing around in the wind. And I just felt incredibly peaceful, incredibly pleasant, incredibly grateful for the time that we had just had. And I knew my default in that situation was to be social to ignore the trees, to, you know, and then I'd make a cutsy conversation with someone and slightly regret it. And, you know, th that was me. And I was able to go, I don't need to go there. And then I was doing a locum for a friend. I, I changed the practice I was, I was working as a salary GP and, and I worked there for six weeks. And they're lovely people, but under pressure like everybody else. And uh, the practice manager came up to me early afternoon and said, the locum, who's doing duty this afternoon can't be here can, you know, you're going to be the only doctor is that okay and I know what the previous me would have done I would have I, my gut would have clenched up my heart would have pounded I'd have gone sweaty and I'd have been in definite red mode in Graham's lane and I'd have probably said yes uh, and I'd have hated it all afternoon and what I did was I said okay thank you for coming along and having that conversation I, I realize that's difficult for everybody can I just take a beat and she said yeah that's fine I said I'll come and find you in your and I went in to the loop and I did a three-part breathing space that we will come to and I came out and I thought okay yeah we can do this we might need to change one or two things but I think we can do this. and I went down to her office and actually she came out of the office and met me halfway down the corridor which said that was a crummy thing to ask and I've actually just got on the phone to someone we use and they can come a bit later on this afternoon and if you don't mind doing the duty bit they'll do the routine bit and we'll sort of and I went you know if she hadn't have come I'd have tried to help but I'd have had one or two suggestions but that that really works for me and I and I just thought who's the person who's just done that that's that's not how I behave but that was literally about a couple of months after I finished the course. And it's that, what I love about it is it's almost like a superpower. It just gives you a bit more time. So my busy life, which I was enjoying, but I felt frazzled on the edges of, 
suddenly became fine. Every bit was fine. And I became energized by every bit. Whereas perhaps without mindfulness, particularly as I got more involved with the red whale, it would have been less fine because I'd have felt pulled and I was able to compartmentalize in a way I couldn't before. It's so amazing how much difference that's made to your life. And I guess what I've never thought of it before is that that muscle analogy that you go to the gym to build your muscle so you can lift that or you can beef it or whatever. And the brain is, yeah, it's like a muscle. You have to train certain bits and it's about actually really training, developing that muscle so that you can actually behave differently. So it's not about just feeling karma, although that is a, a, a good piece of it, but actually that mindfulness muscle that you train, that attention muscle meant that you could actually change your behavior in, in the moment to respond differently. Right. So it's not just about if I do mindfulness, I will feel better, although you probably will, but it's actually my, my behavior will then change as a result of this, which yes. will mean that I will, I will feel better as well. Right. Yeah. It gives you, it gives you skills both for in the moment because you're, you get, better and quicker information from your body that gets you thinking, makes you aware. And the, the trick is to become, become aware because then you're, you can get into a resourceful space. And I've worked with, with mentees and who've needed both a, a tool, a resource. And it's interesting that I'm thinking of one particular individual who had the classic, an exposure to a taster and actually found mindfulness quite useful and would use it as a kind of relaxation at the end of a busy day, but didn't realise that, you know, with, with a bit of a deeper practice, they would have a skill that they could use in the moment. And they were struggling with a particular issue. And then we say on the training, mindfulness is like having a parachute when you jump out of a, a plane. And actually, if you've stitched your parachute together before you jump out of your plane, it's a lot less stressful than trying to do that on the way down. And I think a lot of people try and stitch their parachute on the way down. You know, here's my tool. What's my tool? Let's use my tool. Um, as opposed to, I have a skill. I have a really well-prepared parachute. Oh, I'm out of the plane. Uh, someone pushed me out. But I'm just deploying my parachute and I'm using the skill. There's a meditation within mindfulness called the dealing with difficulty meditation and when you practice it on the course you do it with a cue in the supermarket you know something not too demanding just a sidebar the number of people who the most stressful thing they could come up with that they were happy to deal with on the course was queuing in a supermarket <laughs> well, why is that the most stressful thing you've come up with today, right? If you're a GP, like that would be great. I, you know, I long for the days where I just had to deal with queues in the supermarket. Anyway, yes. <laughs> but it's, it, in terms of the practice, you, <laughs> you can take a more difficult thing when you feel an okay place. Go into a deep meditation, become aware of what your body is doing in response. And almost as you, as you take the thoughts, look at the situation, become aware of what's going on in your body it allows you sometimes to to see that in a very very different way you understand which bits of it are most difficult for you and it can be a very helpful way to deal with things and i i get i go through moments where i i need to do a medication if i feel i'm slipping away from my body i, I know i need to do a body scan if i feel there's a relationship that I struggle with, I, I do a, a kindness meditation. Kindness meditation is where you, you wish health and safety and ease of being to yourself, someone you love, someone you don't really know, the person who serves you a coffee in the local coffee shop, and someone you find really difficult. And actually, the next time you meet that person who you find really difficult, it, it changes things dramatically. But I'll give you, this happened this weekend. We went to see the movies. It's only the second or third time we've been since that's possible. Um, sitting next to three teenage boys, my wife was the other side of me, 12 to 13, on their phones, eating crunchy snacks. Just about tolerable for halfway through the film. I turned around and did the dad thing and said, keep it down, lads. And I actually just spent 
couple of minutes wishing them health and happiness and ease of being. And I completely lost my agitation with them. And I even said cheerio when we left the, the cinema at the end because, you know, I wasn't going to get them to leave or shut up. So, but it made it easier to deal with. And I sometimes almost run to the space where I meditate. I need to do a kindness meditation as a kind of need within me to, to get into that space. This is really, really helpful, Steve. It's about absolutely being aware of what's going in your body so you can detect stuff as it's happening or, or before it ha happens. And if you've practiced the mindfulness stuff, you've, you've sewn your parachute together already before stuff happens. Yes. I'm going to ask you a so what question. On my courses, I always get people to write a so what and a yes but post it so they can come at me with challenges. I think some people might be thinking, yeah, that's all very well, Steve. But, you know, when you were doing that locum, the practice manager said you're on call and you, you recognize your shoulders gone up and you went and you took a minute. That's great. You gave yourself some some time and then you came back to her and luckily she'd, she'd sorted the situation out. So that was actually great. But what if you go off, you do your meditation, you're feeling a bit better, but the situation is still flipping awful and mm. you're still going to do that dreadful thing. Mm. How does it then help you then? Perhaps I'll give you another example. So this is relatively recent. We've been moving dictation systems in the practice. And there was some glitches with the old one before we finally shut it down and got the new one. And there was a kind of, you know, are dictations lost or not? And I came into the practice early and I was met with a suggestion that maybe up to 20 or 30 dictations had been chewed up by the system. I had a busy day and, you know, I don't normally get concerned about patients, but I had a particularly difficult conversation off the bat at 8.30. Um, there was some relational stuff going on at practice and I was caught in a corridor about that. And I was going, oh, I've got this tricky person and I've got to be in the right place to meet them and I'm having this conversation with you and I want to be supportive. But actually, the last thing I need to do is be with you because I possibly have to do 20 or 30 dictations and seven or eight of those need to be done kind of by lunchtime because they're all urgent. And I just went into and, uh, you know, it's perfectly possible to go, oh, I don't know what I do, what I, you know, so be rude to the person I'm talking to who needs me and to go and shout at the secretary, you know, all things I might have done. I just invested in the conversation. We completed. It. I went to the loo did a three-part breathing space, came out, came up with a plan that Barbara, our, our lead secretary, would just review a number of the notes to see whether, you know, the, the most important ones, to see how many of those might be missing. And I asked her to do that, that project. And then I went into my room and I get, gave myself five minutes uh, of breathing practice before I turned the computer off. Tricky patient comes in like these things that it was actually a blast and it was really easy and the rest of the day flowed I just was in a really positive state and we'd lost two or three but not 30 patients what it does is it's, it's that turning what can be you know you start dismissing people shouting at people going into consultations half cop you can slow yourself down this it's almost like this magic trick this matrix thing where you just have more time and that's not finding a trick and leaving yourself an acceptable difficulty you can have the best colleague the best practice in the world and you'll have really tricky days because you know we get sick sad and, and in pain people walking through our doors and you get enough of those in a row it's it, it feels hugely challenging and this is about how to deal with that in the most expert way that you can so you you're, you're the best bit of you for more of the time i get bad days i still get days when i'm just keeping people alive and i'm prescribing at a great rate to to shut things down so i can move on to the next important thing but i get more days when i go do you know what i'm choosing to spend 20 minutes here and i'm gonna do some motivational interviewing and i'm gonna see if we can crack this because I feel resourced to do that and I feel I want to give that a go and that's what it gives me and that's that's why I'm I'm passionate about it. that makes a lot of sense obviously mindfulness does not change 
your situation, but what it does, yes, it slows you down, gets you out of your stress zone, gets you into that more resourceful state. And I've been quoting this equation quite a lot recently that stress equals resources minus demands. So if you feel we've got this much resources, but this much demands, then you're going to be really, really stressed. But actually, if you're then more resourceful than the demands, even though they might be the same, suddenly don't feel don't feel so much. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I certainly do not claim to be an expert on this. I'm doing a lot more reading at the moment because I'm in the middle of a, a qualification. So I'm, I'm going back to the basic science. But, you know, I have taught evidence based medicine consistently since 1993 when I finished my master's in public health. I, I'm passionate about evidence based medicine. I think we should do things where we know they work and we have good evidence. We should, we should do those things. Mindfulness has a secure evidence base on reducing stress. End of. So if you're stressed, you do a mindfulness course. It won't make it worse. It's very unlikely to be neutral. And when we work with our patients, it, it's in nice guidelines for ages for recurrent depression. It's as good as drugs. The, actually, there's very few conditions. It doesn't help. The evidence base is stronger in some areas. So we know from MRI studies, you go through an eight-week MBSR course, your amygdala and hippocampus change shape. When you do a functional MRI, the bits of your brain that are resourceful and calm and generating new ideas light up in a way they didn't light up before you came before. So it's not woo-woo or, you know, this is, a, this is basically Buddhism canned for, for a Western audience. There's a lot to learn from Buddhism, but that's, that's not what it is. It is a carefully worked out psychological technique to give people the benefits that they need. If you ever get time, John Kabat-Zinn, who really developed the MBSR course, or mindfulness as we know it in the West. He was a physician in Massachusetts in the 1970s, and he recognised, like nearly every GP on the planet recognises, a lot of people you can't pigeonhole. And there were lots of people with, with pain or with, with symptoms from their guts that, you know, the gastroenterologist had checked everything and everything was fine. And the chest doctor had said, this chest pain just doesn't seem to have a physical cause. And he developed MBSR. He set it up. And there's a PBS documentary made back in the 1970s of John Kabat-Zinn's first course. And if, if, you're, if you're interested in human beings who are in pain and struggling and how you might help, that is a wonderful hour. Just John Kabat-Zinn working with a group of people who come to realise they can handle their pain in a completely different way. And it's just a lovely piece of television art, really. But that's why it was developed. That's its core. John Kabat-Zinn had a real deep understanding of, of Buddhist Dharma. But, you know, as I've just been explaining with the evidence, there is strong, secure, modern neuroscientific evidence that backs up the formulation that we now have. And indeed, in people who are struggling with depression, you could choose to do a mindfulness-based CBT course. And I suppose that's almost part two for me, that. You know, here it is beneficial for me. I keep it up. I attach practices to things I do in my everyday life when I'm driving, when I'm cleaning my teeth, when I'm exercising. I feel this need to do things. I have that practice in setting up for this podcast. I was talking about an early attendee on one of our courses who came with a congenital problem that left them with muscle imbalance and chronic pain. And, you know, they've been well looked up. They've been to the pain service, usual pain service thing of, you know, lots of drugs and injections, but stuck with a pain level of eight out of 10 most days. After our course developed their personal practice, followed them up a couple of months later, pain three out of 10. So if you look after someone who's in pain and it's a question of do I up the neuroleptic or you know, are they just codeine seeking, all those quite tricky and demanding conversations. You know, here's a technique that did all of that and we've got a strong evidence base for this. We teach this on Red Whale courses about mindfulness affecting chronic pain. But to see it happen to someone that, you know, and you see them change, just so brilliant. I had this in 
this particular patient about a year ago, struggling on a number of levels, overweight, which was going to impact a, another health problem that needed addressing, very little exercise, very anxious, been anxious since they were in their early 20s, now mid-30s, lived with chronic pain, had fibromyalgia, was on tricyclic and neuroleptics, and really in not a great place, and needed to get this medical problem sorted out. And we talked about a different approach to diet and how exercise may benefit weight loss. But about halfway through the year, I introduced this individual to the Netflix series. So Andy Puddicombe, who put the Headspace app together, 19-year-old lad, got, got a bit sad at university, thought, I can't hack this, went off to Tibet to, to be a Buddhist monk. Not, not the common path when you hit that road at 19. Came back, set up Headspace, find him on YouTube, his inspiration. But he's worked with Netflix to put together effectively a classic MBSR course, eight programs, about 20 minutes each. And towards the end of each program is a meditation. And I've just seen this individual because they've lost weight. And not only have they lost weight, they've lost three stone. They do open water swimming. They have no pain. They are on no amitriptyline, no neuroleptics, no pain. They live daily with anxiety since their 20s. And they said, you know, I haven't had an anxious thought for the last month or two. Why didn't people tell me about this when I was in my 20s? How, how have I been allowed to live for 15 years of my adult life without people telling me? And obviously that person was open and you know, I had the, the, the ability to, to do that motivational piece. But the resource is a mindfulness resource, and there it is. It's a relatively easy thing for people to get hold of. And it's had that change. We can all recognise that patient probably. And the outcomes for a lot of them are nowhere close to, to what they have been able to achieve. And mindfulness is a component of, of what that person was using. So I think you know, the other reason is I use it and, and encourage people to pursue it. And it works. Making people better is a nice bit of our job. <laughs> and I love the fact that you've taught evidence-based medicine for 25 years and you're saying, it works, we need to use this. And we're almost out of time, Steve. We do need to finish up. And in a second, I'm going to ask you for your three top tips. Hmm. But I do want, want to just sort of get really practical with this because hmm. I think one of the reasons people don't manage to do it is just because of the time it takes now i know that for any skill because i'm learning ice skating at the moment <laughs> you ah. need to practice <laughs> and if i go from one week my half an hour lesson to the next week of the half an hour lesson and i'm not practiced in between then i still can't go backwards on one foot in a circle very well <laughs> right so i know you've got to practice but we all think okay we'll do mindfulness i'll do my five minute app or whatever will that cut it or do you really need to put in more time and effort into it I went to a conference on mindfulness and someone put it beautifully. It's about prescription and dose. So what are you doing and how often are you, are you doing it? So what we know is, if you're talking about stress, you go through a classic MBSR. That's two hours once a week for eight weeks, plus or minus a silent retreat, which is great fun. And you can practice six days out of seven Roughly 20 minutes, maybe a bit. And the Mark Williams meditations in Finding Peace in a Frantic World are quite short, 10 or 12 minutes. If you can do that, at the end of that period of time, we have an evidence base for the benefit. And if you get those benefits, then you're going to be hooked. And then the, the only other bit is where do you hook those things into your life? And as I say, every morning I do it brushing my teeth. So I become aware of the coldness of the water and the taste of it. I do it for 10 minutes on my drive to work. I turn the radio off. I'm aware of the seat, the noise of the tyres moving over the ground. I, I look at the trees. I think colours, you know, the diff different times of the year, different colours. And I do that. For 10 I don't think about Mrs. Miggins, so I'm seeing third, which is what I used to do. I would drive thinking about Mrs. Miggins and I would ruminate. I'd turn that around. And if Mrs. Miggins comes in, I go, I'm seeing you third. Bye bye. Back to the road noise. Back to, I do it when I exercise, and actually I do it because I I know I have a need. So if I've got 
20 minutes, I won't flick through Twitter. I'll go 20 minutes not on Twitter for this bit of my life and 20 minutes of a kindness meditation because I've got a tricky chat with someone tomorrow. And I just I just want to think good things for them. I want them to be happy. I want them to be safe. I want them to be at ease. Um, when I have that chat, I know it's going to go better. Those are some absolutely fantastic tips for actually how to how to get that into your life. Although it does strike me that that rather eats into your podcast listening time. <laughs> I, I do that on the drive to the gym and back. That's when I do, that's when I do my podcast, or when I'm ironing. Which, oh wow! Uh, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Okay, that's so, so helpful. I love that thing about dose dose and response. Yes, you can do a little bit and that will, of course, it will benefit you. But actually, if you, you want a really good benefit and let's face it, we all have 20 minutes a day, even though we say we don't, we make time for what is important to us. And if it's 20 minutes doing a meditation rather than scrolling through social media, then I think I'm I'm up for that. So I'd like some three tips in a minute, but you've mentioned a few resources which I think would be useful. That that book, Finding Peace in a Frantic World by Mark Williams is fantastic. And you can get his meditations, I think for free on Audible, can't you? And there's a CD yes. that comes with the book. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's the Netflix documentary yeah. and the Headspace Netflix. There's that documentary with John Kabat-Zinn as well. Uh, would you recommend any particular MBSR courses? How would somebody find one of those courses? I mean, if you literally put MBSR and in your county, things will start coming up. I was often asked that when we were on the road with Red Whale and got some amazing responses. I was in Norwich, for example, and the new medical school there is giving medical students an opportunity to train in, um, in mindfulness. So there may be something within your trust, there may be something within your patch, something within your deanery. I'd, I'd look at all of those to be a teacher and I'm going through that formal accreditation process. You know, you, you, you need a, a properly trained and supervised an ongoing CPD type teacher. Mm, great. Thank you, Steve. So what would your three top tips be just to finish us off? If something I've said about what the benefits of this are strikes you as I'd like that, I, I would strongly encourage you not to just simply try an app or something like that, to do a formal MBSR course. That's what's got the evidence. Um, it has to be the right time, obviously, but I would strongly encourage you to do that. I think even if you don't develop a formal practice, I would explore skills like the three-part breathing space that we might have a little go at in a minute, because that, you know, even without the, the, the depth of, of a practice, that that is a way of just giving you a chance to get into a more resourceful state. And so you know, I offer that as something that anyone can use. You know, I looked on my phone and it's, it's there on YouTube, Mark Williams. He's got a beautiful voice. And I think, you know, even if it's not something that you feel you need, you're in you know, quite a good place, this doesn't seem to be something that you, you need, then the resources we've started talking about for patients it's flipping yourself to kind of what resource would this person actually be able to practically access, use and get a benefit from? And the Netflix program has, has really made a difference to a lot of my patients. So if you're not aware of that, give that a go. It can make a big difference. That's great. Thank you. So Steve has really kindly offered to take us through the three-part breathing space that takes three minutes or less. But Steve, before we do that, and we'll finish up with that, if people wanted to get hold of you, where should, where should they look? Presumably they can get you on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. We can put the link for that in the show notes. So before we go to the breathing space, thank you so much. That has just been absolutely fascinating. I, I think I'm definitely going to book on an MBSR course and maybe we can, maybe we can twist your arm to run one for us, Steve. How would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, as I say, I, I teach it in a faith-based context which i'm accredited to do but i'm going through the accreditation process with bangor university to uh, get that formal accreditation and that allows you to be much more flexible with the way you use it marvelous and we'd love to get you back on the podcast again sometime to share your wisdom with us again so thank you so much for being with us that's my pleasure
And now, let for for those of you that want to want to carry on, Steve's going to lead us in a, a three part breathing space, which I'm going to do now. So I'm going to mute myself and just listen to you, Steve. So as we come to this practice, we can do it sitting or standing or in any position that you feel comfortable. Just take a moment to ground yourself. Just become aware of whatever's supporting you. If you're standing, it's the ground coming up to meet your feet. And the pressure on the boards and the heel of your foot. If you're sitting, it's the chair you're sitting on. Maybe the back you're sitting again. And now let's become aware of the weather system for us now. Our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, maybe physical sensation. Just noticing. And it's tempting sometimes a distraction may come for us. A, a thought about something we have done or should do. Just notice that. And then come back to this weather system. You can think of it like an hourglass. And we're at the top of the hourglass and we're just aware of all that's going on. And now I want you to focus your attention at the pinched point of the hourglass. Focus on your breathing. Just follow a few breaths all the way in and all the way out. Perhaps noticing your coolness on the back of your throat, and your tummy rising and falling. Just follow the movement of the breath. Breathing all the way in and all the way out. And finally, you're ready. We're at the bottom of the hourglass as it expands again. You just become aware of what you're sitting on, the room you're in, the building that that room is in, where you are. Sounds around you. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And perhaps we can commit to be more mindful in the moments that have come. And just deal with things as they are in this moment. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Don't forget, we provide a self-coaching CPD workbook for every episode. You can sign up for it via the link in the show notes. And if this episode was helpful, then please share it with a friend. Get in touch with any comments or suggestions at hello at youarenotafrog.com. I love to hear from you. And finally, if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate it and leave a review wherever you're listening. It really helps. Bye for now. <laughs>